Sonia, I'll be reading from today, reading today's scripture, which comes from Lamentations, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and 19 through 26. Please give your attention to the reading of God's word. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. And now let's give our attention to the preaching of God's word. Thank you. Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you, Sonia, for reading it. I am very encouraged and blessed by those who participate in reading the scriptures and praying for our congregation. Early Merry Christmas to you. Cannot believe it's December, the Advent season begins, and I'll explain why I would choose a passage like this. I think it's one of the most neglected topics, not an easy one, but as a pastor who loves you, loves this church, I think lamenting is something we're missing, and without it, will never be healthy and whole. So in this Advent season, as we just read from Lamentation chapter 3, let's learn to lament. Let's learn to lament. Uh, last week I had mentioned to cry and to complain is human and natural. Nobody had to teach you to do that. You came into life. You wondered why as soon as you were outside your mother's womb, no one had to teach you to cry and to complain. But the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Spirit teach us to lament. Lamenting is different from crying and complaining. Because lament means to take all your cries and complaints and to turn them toward God. So it takes faith to lament. It takes discipline to lament. It is distinctively Christian to lament, and you will only grow as a Christian in the reality of the brokenness of life all around us and in us by learning to lament. In the ancient Greek version of the Old Testament, which is called the Septuagint, Lamentations is translated as wailings. Wailings. All right? Think like, K-drama wailings, unordered, unkept, unfiltered, not prepared, like just ugly, messy, not linear, never nice and neat, never controlled, just wailings. Well, we have the most vivid and extended book of the Bible dedicated to wailings or lamentations. Three things to guide us along today. The need to lament first, second, never changing anchors or never changing truths that anchor us in lament. Third, never wasted, okay? Need to lament, never changing. Third, never wasted. First, the need, the need. Oh, the aching need. I think these days, my theory, working theory now is if you ask somebody, how are you really doing? Like, how are you really doing? Depending upon the trust and the time and space, I think most people, if they were honest to the question of how you're really doing, 
I think people would just cry. I think people would just wail. I think people would lament. Ecclesiastes teaches us it's better to go into the house of mourning, better to go to a funeral than a festival, better to go to the funeral than a party. I mentioned this many times before. Recently, I cannot forget at the funeral of one Ernest Lee, 37 year olds from lung cancer. At the end of the funeral, they played taps, they folded the flag, gave it to the parents. A decorated officer, his life was cut way too short by lung cancer. As a pastor for that ceremony, I was able to sit with the family 30 minutes before the funeral service began. I forgot, I really did, I was shocked at first, what wailing really sounds like. Of the parents, the mom and the dad, saying goodbye to their son in the casket for about 20 minutes straight, uninterrupted, loud, heart-crushing. But, you know, as one of your pastors, I was sitting there listening to that, at first shocked and then strangely comfortable, strangely, like, relieved. And I think it only provoked the sense of recognizing my own need to lament, to lament, lament. Do you lament? Do you know what that is? Is that part of your Christian life? Is it part of your prayers? Is it part of your worship to weep and wail to God? If not, our default modes are numbness, denial, Anger and rage and bitterness. You're either in denial or just active anger. But there's a better way. We need to learn to lament. I think lamentations are like a war memorial, like the Vietnam War Memorial. Why do we have war memorials? It's not only for cathartic expressions of sorrow and loss. So much to lament in the world. Sickness your children, wars, financial devastation, losses. But like a war memorial, lamentations are only not only cathartic, but they are there to have us remember and learn the most important lessons. Learn the most important lessons. Lament to learn. Learn some things. I've just got two lessons according to this passage. Number one, for the people of God who was Israel, they needed to learn to lament over sin. Okay? Actual, real, like rampant, explicit, personal and nationwide sins. Chapter one, verses 18 and 19, I'll read it for us. It says, the Lord is in the right. By the way, Everything else in the world could falsely or fairly, truthfully or not, charge you, attack you, give a lawsuit to you, yes, but not from God, never. The Lord is always in the right. The Lord is in the right, for I have rebelled against his word. But hear all you peoples and see my suffering. My young women and my young men have gone into captivity. Verse 19, I call to my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and elders perished in the city while they sought food to revive their strength. Lesson number one, Lamentations was written by the prophet Jeremiah so that the nation along with him. Now, Jeremiah wasn't even actually guilty of all these sins, but he is incorporating, personalizing the sins of his people whom he loves. We have to lament over explicit sins. According to the chapter or the verses I just read, what is the sin of Israel? Well, they called out to lovers, but the lovers let them down. The people of God fell in love with other lovers, but those lovers tricked them and brought about devastation. 
All idolatry, the number one commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. Every time you sin or break a commandment is because you break the number one commandment. Something or someone else has become your God. All idolatry is, in this passage, adultery. It's like spiritual adultery. You're getting into bed with another person. You're getting into bed with another object. You see, whatever today captures most of your attention, captures most of your heart, captures most of your energies, captures your dreams, captures your fears, captures your heart, mind, and soul more than God. If there's anything in all the world that captures you more than God, you are in adulterous sin. That which command your deepest devotion and sacrifices of you is your real lover or your real God, right? It used to be I'll sacrifice everything, everything for my survival and my career. Maybe some people now it's I'll sacrifice everything, everything for my kids and their welfare and success, or I'm living vicariously still through my kids, or romance and fall in love. I'll sacrifice everything for that as long as I can stay in love. Oh, but Jeremiah, who was called by God to call out the people of God, to explain the reasons of why they are lamenting, why they are so ruined, is all lovers, all, all idols, just a matter of time, they're going to let you down. They really will. Look at the first six verses, which we just read in chapter 3. How personal God is. Did you know God is so personal? Do you relate and enjoy a personal relationship with a personal God? Not a cosmic force, not an unknown name or deity, not a removed, aloof, indifferent being up in the sky. No, someone immensely and intensely personal with you. And look at how personal God takes it with adultery against him. One verse says, Jeremiah says, against me, against me, he turns his hand again and again all day long. Who talks like that? Only people who are in a personal relationship with God. God is so personal and he takes it very personal of how you behave. How you act, how you may forget and forsake the only one who loves you so. No therapist, no psychologist, no science, no entertainment, no escape can resolve if God is against you personally and his hand is against you again and again all day long. Nothing can fix that. And why would God's hand be against you all day long. It's because you betrayed him. You love someone or something else more than him. It's adultery. Oh, I'm going to be careful with this. And you suspect your spouse is cheating on you. You hire a private investigator to go figure out if your spouse is really adulterous and cheating on you. And God forbid you do find out that your spouse is cheating on you. And then you find out who your spouse is cheating on you with. And lo and behold, you find out that the other person that your spouse is in bed with is far less worthy. Hmm? Yes, far less beautiful, far less than you. How would you feel? How would you feel? And my friends, that's why we have lamentations and that's why we have a prophet. He's saying, this is somewhat of God, how personally, how he feels of a adulterous lover, someone whom he loves, but continues to get in bed with so many other lovers. 
Oh, so Jeremiah's tall task as a prophet of God is to call the people of God out and to explain the reasons why we are where we are. Why we need to learn to lament. Well, God's holy wrath and judgment has been poured out. Judgments and warnings are being all fulfilled because of individual, nationwide, institutional, corporate, cultural, and systemic sins. Lesson number one. We cannot bypass. We will never bypass the need to lament over sins. Now, of course, the Bible never says all your reasons for lamentations or troubles or problems are the direct results of sin. Chapter 3, verse 52 tells us there are unfair, unvalidated Cancel culture to the extreme where I just lump you with every other abuser and oppressor that I've ever felt. There are charges without cause. There are accusations that are totally false. But surely, my friends, so much of our lamentations and troubles and sufferings are the results of sins, are they not? Here's lesson number two. If lesson number one is the need to lament over sins, lesson number two is this. Lament to repent and heal from your sins. This is where uh, one of your pastors has really, really neglected. The time and space it would take to not only confess your sins, but to lament and mourn over them. Blessed are those who mourn. Not to just go pass it by really quick. Oh, Lord, I committed that sin again. I might have slandered. I might have lusted. I was full of pride. I reacted this way. Mm. But to lament over it. And why would you have an entire book of the Bible that spends extended vivid time lamenting over sins that you know God would forgive. Well, here's why. It's so that you could see and feel and sense how wicked, how serious, how evil, how offensive it really is to God. To spend time in lamentations this Advent season is to help you repent and heal from your sins. Jeremiah did. And I actually want to give you a clue. God does too. God laments over the sins of his people. A commentator, he's at Fuller Seminary now, Sung Chan Ra on Lamentations, quote, Christian communities arising from celebration do not want their lives changed because their lives are in a good place. That is a searing, searing observation. Here's what I think Sun Chan Ram means. There's no problem. There's a place for optimism, positive songs and seminars, happy songs and praise, which of course dominate the American evangelical landscape. However, although praise songs have their place, Most churches and Christians who never want to spend time in laments, maybe it's because you don't want to see or repent from your comfortable sins. Maybe you and I avoid lamentations because you don't actually want to feel how evil or offensive that is. Maybe a lot of Christian churches across America spend a lot of times with happy songs because you want to stay happy and comfortable the way that you are. But, oh, what if lamentations were to come in? Not only over losses and crises and sicknesses and devastations of life, but over sins. Sins. Our sin. My sin. And if you do so, God will do something with it that nothing else really ever can. 
I think there are parts of your life and my life that if you don't bring it in lamentations to God, will come out in a hundred different forms way, way less healthy. If you don't learn to lament before God, there are dimensions and all these things of your heart, mind, and soul that will, you can't help it, but will still just bleed out in much more destructive or toxic forms. But the book of Lamentations is given to us where God is telling us through a prophet, God wants all the broken, messy, ugliest parts of your life. He doesn't want you to go to worship or to go to church with seriously inconsistent, hollow experiences. And for those of us in this room, where if you've not learned to lament before your God, well, that's why actually you and I might be so unwell. Let me say that again. If you have not learned to lament over sins and to lament to repent and be set free from your sins, there's nothing else in the world that could heal and make you well before God himself. The need to lament. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Hopefully you remember that book. It hasn't been too long ago. We just finished it. Apostle Paul sent a letter to a church who had personally attacked him, grieved him, opposed him, questioned him, maligned him, publicly slandered him, attacked him, hated on him. So he sent a letter to them, a letter preceding 2 Corinthians that did actually a lot of effective work for many people at Corinth. And here's what Paul says about them. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved by his previous letter, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There's such a thing as godly grief versus worldly grief. Godly lamenting and wailings and just worldly wailings. What would make the difference? One leads to salvation and life without regret. The other leads to death. What in the world could make the difference between the two? How can you grieve or lament in a godly way that leads to life and salvation versus grieving and lamenting in a worldly way that's just self-destructive? I keep coming back to this in marriage relationship. Let's say one day your spouse comes to you and says, I'm really done. I'm done. I'm finished. This has been a hundred times we fought over the same issue. You will not change. I'm actually out. I'm done. And sorry, I'm just going to pick on men like myself and husbands usually. The husband turns around and says, honey, what? I didn't know it was that bad. I had no idea it had gotten this bad. No, please, no, let's work it out. Now, a husband who says to a wife who says, I'm really done, I'm sick and tired, I can't go on anymore in this love relationship, a husband who just says, let's work it out because I never knew it was this bad and I can't face the consequences of life without you, like the shame and maybe I can't live without you. That kind of grieving, you see, that kind of loss, that kind of lamenting, can I suggest to you, is still very self-centered. It'll make you behave and conform and change superficially for a short period of time. Whereas a different husband who hears from a wife, I'm done, I'm done, I'm out of here, I can't take this anymore, I need to move on. That husband, a different husband says... I didn't know I hurt you so. I didn't know how much I had broken your heart. I didn't know how much I had betrayed your beauty and intelligence and dignity. Honey, I'm so sorry that I sinned against you. After the track record of love and goodness from you. You see, one kind of grief is self-obsessed 
The other kind of grief is obsessed with the one you sinned against. One kind of grief and lamenting is, oh, woe is me. What's going to happen to me? And the consequences, I got caught. The other kind of grief and lamenting is, I can't believe I broke your heart. And every Christian person in this room has a track record to how good and gracious and loving and kind a personal God has been to you. And what Paul is suggesting here is this. Godly grief is to not just be concerned about yourself, but it's to look at the most beautiful one whom you sinned against. And when you do, that is a kind of godly hurt that lends itself to healing you like no other. There is a godly grieving and wailing and lamenting and repenting that is more concerned with the God you sinned against that will bring you back to life like no other experience can. Lamentations, the need to lament. I don't know if anyone in this room is with me on this. The need to lament over rampant and explicit sins. And then second lesson is lament to repent and set free, to be set free from your sins. Lamentations happens when you bring all your whys. Hows, God, how could you do this to me? You bring all your whys, all your complaints, and when you don't get an answer in your laments, you are moved toward the who. A lament, which takes faith, it takes attention, it takes discipline, it does take some work, is where you bring all your whys to God, and then you are moved into the presence of who. All right, now the never-changing anchors in our laments. Please don't just do the first part. <laughs> Please don't just, it's better to wail to God, yes, than just anyone else, but just don't stop there. You must have never-changing truths to anchor you. Look at verses 22 and 23, Lamentations chapter 3. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Never changing anchor, the steadfast love and the mercies of God do not come to an end. The steadfast love and mercies of God never cease for his people, his children. Oh, they do cease for the world, by the way. But the steadfast love and mercies of God never come to an end for those who need it. For those who need it. I was uh, struck or reminded by these lyrics over the weekend. <clears throat> Again, an Irish rock band, U2. It's called So Cruel, So Cruel. The song ends by saying, to stay with you, I'd be a fool. To stay with you, I'd be a fool. At the beginning of the song, it sings, you know, I'm only hanging on to watch you go down. I'm only hanging on to watch you go down. Your love is like a see-through dress. I put my lips to your lips to put a stop to the lies. So cruel. It's a song of unrequited love, betrayal, adultery. But to stay with you, I'd be a fool. And yet, of course, this is exactly the song that God sings over you. The steadfast love and mercies do not come to an end even for those who are not faithful. Lesson number two, or anchor number two, never changing, never changing. Look at verse 31 and 32, 31 and 32 of Lamentations. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. God will always have the final word. God has the final say. You don't get to write your final chapter. You don't get to conclude it on your own. 
No, God will, especially if you're his. God has the final word. One of the former missionaries that we'll be able to meet in Southeast Asia reminded me that at the lowest point of his life when he was losing his missionary career, his missionary calling, probably losing his reputation, and then quite frankly, for a season of time there, was losing his mental and nervous system and physical faculties. He reminded me at that point that I had been able to visit him out in Japan and told him, hey, God's not done with you yet. God hasn't finished with you yet. And he reminded me recently about that and how true that is from the word of God. No matter where you're at, where you find yourself at, God has the final word. God has the final word. Never changing anchor number three. Look at verse 33. Verse 33. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. You know what doesn't change? The heart of God for you. Now, I don't know if you really know that. I don't know if you really feel that. For some of you, don't really feel that because of your family dynamics and history. Never let you really feel this. But you can go to prison and go to a dungeon. If you're a child of God, God's heart never changes for you. You can experience all kind of trauma and loss. God's heart never skips a beat or forgets you. The heart of God is even for Israel who deserved all the wrath, all the punishment, all the discipline, at least in the Old Testament. And even for you now where he cannot punish you again for your sins, but yes, bring about holy correction. Oh, bring about so much loving discipline. His heart behind the rod. His heart behind the hardship. His heart behind the suffering and the tears. All the frustration. You should not question. If you grieve, if you suffer, if you wail, I want you to know, God does not take heart in that. He is not happy about that. He is not rejoicing over that. No, because his heart is always for you. His heart is wrapped up with yours. He's a perfect father whose heart rises and falls with yours. It aches and breaks for you. And you can only feel that when you learn to lament to him. C.S. Lewis once famously observed, I never questioned God was out for my best. I never questioned if God was good. But I did always question how much pain it would take. God never rejoices or delights in the suffering or the hardship or the discipline of his own children. But his heart is always for you. Listen. One of your pastors, I don't have the stomach or the discipline to preach to to you through Lamentations 1 and 2 or 4 or 5. I'm just going to be honest. I don't even know how to prepare it. I don't even know if you'd come to church if we spent five weeks on it. We are like allergic to this topic. Everything wants to be positive, optimistic, and hopeful. Give me happy stuff. But that's not real life. And I want you to know Lamentations 3 only comes after the most vivid, the most explicit wailing in tears. There's two chapters nonstop. But what I find remarkable about Jeremiah is Israel is smoldering in ruins. Her sons and daughters have been taken away. Her priests and elders are perishing. Her monuments and temples have been burnt to the ground. Her wealth and treasures have been stolen. People have been taken advantage of. Her land is lost. They are now enslaved to a foreign empire after 586 BC. And while everything lies in the ruins in the backgrounds, we have one prophet daring to anchor himself upon three truths at least. And then he dares to say and stares to sing and dares to write the steadfast love. And the mercies of God 
will not come to an end. The need to lament. You must learn to lament to God. Extended time and space with all kinds of emotions and expressions to him, anchored by a never-changing God. He will have the final word. His heart is always for you, and his love and mercies do not come to an end. Let's close with this. Never waste it. Need to lament, never changing, never wasted, never wasted. I used to think, and I still do think, you know, Harold, in your busy schedule, some of you are busier than I, of course. Why would you ever interrupt your schedule and take time and space to lament? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So uncomfortable. It takes so much effort. Why bother to lament? Why bother to lament? As I've suggested to you two before, if you don't learn to lament, this is why you are unwell. This is why it may be unhealthy and unwell. If you don't learn to lament as an individual or as a church with losses or crises or sins, just straight up sins, pride, just divisiveness, just gross things. If you never lament over these things, how do you expect God to heal and set you free from those things? There's an entire book dedicated to it. And there are most of the Psalms, a third of them are dedicated to lament, to lament. It doesn't just make you human. It doesn't just make you whole to lament, but God loves to meet with you and use it in your laments. Nicholas Wolterstorff in a book entitled Lament for a Son. I shall look at the world through tears. Perhaps I shall see things that dry-eyed I could not see. Wailing and waiting, never wasted in the economy of God. So verses 25 and 26 of Lamentations 3, once again. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Oh, this really speaks to me and my type the ones who want to know what's going on, the ones who want to assure that it's a better future, the ones who want to have certain things under control, the ones who don't want unnecessary delays or wasted times, the ones who don't want to go through a season of hardship or darkness of the night or long lamentations. But here it says, the Lord is good to people who do that. The Lord uses that. He loves to use you as you wait. It is good to wait and to trust quietly for the salvation of the Lord. And here's why as we close in Psalm chapter 56, verse 8. Psalm 56, verse 8. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? The marvel of the God of the Bible in Psalm 103 is that he takes all your sins and my sins and he throws them and casts them as far as the east is from the west. Go read it. The holy God of the Bible who knows all and sees all chooses to do something where he takes all of our sins and remembers them no more. He wants to forget them forever. And he will never bring them up again against you. But yet in Psalm 56 and according to Lamentations, the same God who forgets all of our sins will remember our tears. The very same God who says, I will throw away and never bring up your sins against you, but let me collect your tears. Let me record every one. Let me compile them in a bottle. And why would God do that? So that he will bring about an ultimate and full healing and restoration one day 
where he will wipe every tear from your eyes. No more sinning, no more shaming, no more loss, and no more lamentations and wailing. I long for Jesus to come back like never before, the second coming. Advent season is for the whole Christian worldwide community is to long and celebrate. Oh, because of his first coming, he is coming back. And it is because of a weary world in need of a thrill, a weary world who is aching to rejoice, a weary world who is wailing and lamenting nonstop because of ultimately God's hand is against you. But what if the very hands of God that were against you came down in the form of human flesh of Jesus Christ, born in a manger, and his own hands would be hung up for you? The hands that were against you are now for you. As he surrendered himself, he says, I'll take all your sins to remember them no more. But this very God-man, Jesus Christ, why did he come? Why did he come? Not only a way to take away and forget, forgive all your sins, but to show up at a funeral of his friend and weep. Not only a way to take away all your sins, but a God who bleeds and weeps. How can you and I ever dare think lamenting is unimportant or unnecessary? When God showed up in Jesus Christ to lament himself. Dear friends, I don't want you to take my word. I want you to take God's word for it. This sermon, and like many other sermons on prayer, won't mean much if you don't have an action item to it. You can leave this place moved or inspired, think that some things were really helpful. But if you don't learn to lament, just open up a lament in the Psalms or Lamentations, read it, and then just say whatever it provokes in your mind and heart. I can't think of anything better for you to do in the Advent season. Read a lament verse by verse, and then say when it says, how long, how long, oh Lord, will you forsake me? How long, oh Lord, will you forget me? After you read that verse, just say or pray, Lord, I do feel like that. I feel like you've forsaken me about this. I feel like you forgot me about this. I feel like how come you weren't there when this happened? Hey, how come I feel like this other person who keeps attacking me? Why won't you take care of it? Do it. Do it. Have an action item. Go and learn to lament. Learn to lament, because in your lamentations, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. God will have the final word. God will have the final word. God, his heart for you will never change, and none of it will ever be wasted. Would you join me? Let's pray together this morning. Father in heaven, as we are in Advent season now, as we celebrate and reflect upon why Jesus had to come in the first place. Holy Spirit, please grab a hold of our attention and hearts and minds. Teach us to lament, to lament over sins, to lament over my sins, to lament over our sins, so that you might heal and set us free from them. Holy Spirit, would you do this miraculous healing work Show us things through tears we could never see before. And, oh, Lord, anchor us that you will wipe away every tear one day as we come to you, as we fall into your arms. Hear us, we pray. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.